can't stay to see you go. I love you more, more than you ever know. I can't stay to see you go. I love you more, more than you ever know. Uh, yeah. Uh, just with me. Come on. Yeah. Ah. We doing a reading. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. We doing a reading. Today, we're going to read with JB. We're going to read with JB. We're going to, uh, 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 uh. Open that book up, reading rainbow. <laughs> Hello. Good day, everybody. Welcome to the JB Font channel. I am your host, James Fontleroy. As always, it's so good to see you today. Now, just to let you guys know, the JB Font channel is available on all major podcast platforms like Anchor, Apple, Spotify, and Google. Google Podcast, so you can subscribe to me there. I'm also part of the Revolutionary Blackout Network, so you can catch me on the JB Show on Sundays at 1, on RBN Live on Tuesdays at 4, and the Savvy and JB Show on Thursdays at 6. Also, I also do my own stream on this channel on Tuesdays at 2, if you guys would like. If you are watching this and like the readings, then please make sure that you Give me a thumbs up to let me know that you like these readings, as well as to project it out so that more people can hear the messages within the readings. Also, thank you to everyone who is a patron on Patreon, Coffee, as well as members. Thank you so very much. Without you guys, I would not be able to do this, as well as anybody and everyone who also sends me mutual aid various do various platforms that may be you know, to me, to help me so that I can keep the lights on. Literally, uh, if you guys would like to get to those links, those are also in the description below. Well, as you can tell, I am reading chapter three, part two of Asada, an autobiography. This is gonna be more interesting than actually chronicles her her dealings within the prison system really the prison industrial complex as so accurately put by many of the comrades on the left and this is going to be a very interesting reading to see the beginnings of her trial back in 1973 so this is going to be you know a very detailed reading so i am really amped to read this part for you so this is chapter three we're doing part two so we wanted to cut it into two parts so that the, the streams won't be too long so in chapter three we're going to be starting on page 57 of chapter three part two and we'll be going all the way into chapter four which is on page 71 so if you're following along in this reading then you can read this as well I as typically, whenever I do these readings, I also do maybe do a pause just to expound on any points that were made, either to add some modern context to what she's talking about, because this was written back in the day, or I, I will expound on it through my own personal analysis. So this isn't a necessarily a narration, but it's a reading with my footnotes being spoken. If that makes any sense, that's right. Okay, but that's why you came here, right? All right, so we're gonna get into the reading. Um, and once we get into this, it's gonna be very interesting. And by the way, can we just comment on the amount of sass and spice that Asada Shakur has? Spicy Asada is the best Asada. Yeah. Man, I wish I could tell her to, to her face. Be like, man, you are everything when you are spicy. I absolutely love it. Keep it up, queen. Anywho, let's get started in the reading. All right. Oh, by the way, before I get started, I have my tea it's 
my yeah. Hit just right. Right there, right in the taste buds. Okay. Let's start. Because I had a broken clavicle, I had to wear a figure eight brace around my shoulders. It was made of foam and cotton on and the tiny belt buckle fastener on the back, about a half inch wide. One morning, I was eating, and the guard came in my cell and took it. You can't have this. Why? Because it contains metal, she replied. You can't have anything with metal on it. Now, there I was, sitting on a metal cot, drinking out of a metal cup, eating out of a metal bowl, and this policewoman standing in my face tells me I couldn't have my brace because this tiny metal buckle? I raised all the hell I could. But I saw that she was, like she said, like they all say, only following orders. If the prison doctor says you need it, you can have it back. As soon as Dr. Miller came into the workhouse, I asked to see him. Without the brace, my shoulder felt weak and fragile. I could barely hold myself up straight. Don't worry about that, old Grace, her doctor told me. You don't need that thing anyway. It was all I could do to not kick him in his groin. Luckily, later that week, the bone specialist came out from the hospital to see me. He was a good doctor and a very kind man. He told the, he told the warden in no uncertain terms that I needed my brace. And without it, I could be disfigured. He gave me a lot of encouragement from my hand so that I could regain full use of it. Finally, they returned the brace. It was about that time that miracles started. I was sure now that my hand was coming back to life. I was beginning to, to be able to see, to tell it to, I'm sorry, I was beginning to be able to tell it to do things and it would actually respond. Each little bit of progress was a miracle. Being able to touch my pinky with my thumb, to pick up a cup, to hold a pencil, pencil, to pinch myself, wear feet. That took days of practice and exercise to accomplish. And then, and then the day came when I knew I was almost there. After months of trying, I could finally snap my fingers. Whenever anyone came to see me, I would show them my new talents. I felt like a little kid saying, look, mommy, see what I can do. Finally, a joint conference was arranged between Sandiata and me with Evelyn present. It took place at the workhouse. Sandiata was brought from the New Brunswick jail. I never been happier to see anyone in my life. It was difficult to talk because the guards were practically sitting in our laps. I can't whisper for nothing. And Evelyn kept telling me to lower my voice. We talked about the case and decided that it was politically correct to be tried together. Just seeing San Sandiata cooled me right out. I was feeling bad and I was self-conscious about how I looked. I had broken out, and broken out in a horrible rash from the prison soap and I looked like a lopsided scarecrow with bumps. There was something about Sandiata that ex exudes calm. From any, every part of his being, you can sense the presence of revolutionary spirit and fervor. And his love for black people is so intense that you can almost touch it and hold it in your hand. There's nothing put on about him. He looks like he belongs on a porch somewhere down south, breathing in the summer air and bouncing babies off his knee. The truth of the matter is that Sandiata is country. He would deny it to the better end, but he's show enough country. And when he laughs that giggle of his, it's like a trip to Texas in the backwoods. When the conference ended, I was in I was a different person. I felt much stronger and I didn't feel alone. I don't know when, but somewhere along the way I started to collect the metal cups we were given to drink from. At first, I think it would 
was just my slow way of drinking that caused the cups to accumulate. I was none too popular with the guards, especially the men. Most of them hadn't said boo to me and vice versa, but they hated my guts. To them, I was a cop killer and they were cops. Something told me to be real careful. They had given me a little table to eat and write on. At night, before I went to sleep, I pushed the table up to the bars and stacked the cups precariously on top of it. The bars opened to the cell and the slightest movement would set the whole stack of cups clanging into the floor. I would push the, one, the wooden bench behind the table and that way anyone who tried to come in would have to apply some real pressure and went through this routine every night feeling slightly foolish but compelled. One night in the middle of the night, the cups came crashing down. I immediately woke to two, I'm gonna say, I immediately woke up to find four or five male guards standing in the doorway of my cell. I screamed, what do you want? What are you doing in my cell? Loud enough for someone to hear me. The guards stood in the doorway like they didn't know what to do. Finally, one of them locked the door and said, we heard a noise and we came to investigate. We're just checking it out. They weren't even supposed to be in the women's section. The female guard on duty that night, the slimiest one in the prison, was nowhere in sight. After that, no matter what jail I was in, I always found some way to barricade myself. In prisons, it's not that all uncommon to find a prisoner hanged or burned to death in his cell. No matter how suspicious the circumstances, these deaths are always ruled suicides. They're usually black inmates cons considered to be a threat to the orderly running of the prison. They're usually among the most politically aware and socially conscious inmates in the prison. Sometimes they do that. Sometimes that's the way it happens in these cells. Sometimes the most politically conscious or what the days in, in the black community we call woke. The most politically and economically conscious people are typically the ones that are punished the most because they can't even be put around the other prisoners, the other inmates, because what they can say can influence them. And if they influence the entire mass of prisoners, inmates, slaves, then guess what? And the prison has a whole mess on their hands. And it's kind of hard to be a prison that forces prisoners, inmates, to produce things if they all are in the hole, if they all are in solitary. Because what really can they do? They just exist in there. They need them to work. That's what they want you to do in prison for the prison industrial complex. When Eva came to the workhouse, it was something of an event. Usually she occupied the cell I was in. The rest of the women were housed in two open dormitories. The guards didn't even know what to do with her. She had been in that tent jail many times before and she was known as a hell raiser. Everybody said she was crazy. My first encounter with Eva was when she came to the bar and sat down outside my cell and told me that she would astro travel. She called it something like astro space projection. I can go anywhere I want to, whenever I want to, she told me. I just came from Jupiter. How was it? I asked her. Oh, it was fine. They had these cute little people. They were purple with crocodile skin and blue hair. You can go anywhere you want to, she told me. You just have to project yourself. Can you show me how to project myself the hell out of here? Oh, that's easy, she said. I do that all the time. As a matter of fact, I'm not here now. No, I said, that's not good enough. I want to project my mind and my body out of here. You'll be in jail wherever you go, Eva said. You have a point there, I told her. 
but I'd rather be in a minimum security prison or on the streets than a maximum security prison in here. The only difference between here and the streets is the one is maximum security and the other is minimum security. The police patrol our communities just like the guards patrol here. I don't have the faintest idea how it feels to be free. That's a sentiment that's shared by many black people. We don't know how, what it feels to be free, even though, even though slavery was abolished, we still don't know what it feels like to truly be free. Go to any hood. Any hood is really an open air prison where the police basically are just the corrections officers that drive up around in cars. You just have a few more liberties, but you're not really truly free. That's how it feels. Eva told me that she knew how I felt. She had to know. Any black person in America, if they're honest with themselves, had got to come to the conclusion that they don't know what it feels like to be free. We aren't free politically, economically, or socially. We have very little power over what happens in our lives. In fact, a black person in America isn't even free to walk down the street, walk down the wrong street, in the wrong neighborhood at night, and you know what happens. Hello, Amon Aubrey. Eva and I got on famously. A lot of times I didn't understand what in the world she was talking about. But at times she made so much sense, I wondered if it really was the world that was crazy. She taught me a lot in prison and she was forever telling some funny story about her life. Eva was a huge sister. She weighed about 300 pounds. She was very dark skinned and her hair was cut short next to her scalp. People who have accepted white European standards of beauty would find her unattractive. But to me, there was something beautiful about her and I love to look at her. She was one of the few people I have met in life who have the courage to be almost totally honest. Altogether, Eva has spent about 10 years in the Clayton Correctional Facility for Women in New Jersey. She had been there and, I'm sorry, she had been there in the old days when the women worked out in the farm. She told me how the women were treated, that state troopers would be called in for the slightest disturbance. She, she was there during the riot at Clinton and had seen state troopers beat women mercilessly. Once, they had beaten a pregnant woman so badly, she lost her baby. They killed her, basically. Around this time, I started taking my little walks. Staying cooped up in the cage all day was driving me up the wall. So when the guards brought my food, I would walk past them into what was called the day room where the one of them ate and watched TV. I would walk first to one dorm, then to the other, then return to myself. There was no place I could run since there were two or three locked doors between me and the outside. Most of the guards would nag me to come back to my cell and after a short time, I would. But one of them got too crazy about it until one day a guard yelled at me, get back in here. Do you hear me? Get back here. If there is one thing I can't stand, it's being ordered around. And if there's another thing that makes me go wild, it's for a white person to talk to me in that tone of voice. You make me come here, I told her. You so big and bad. I want you to see, I want to see you make me come back in there. She made a move like she was going to grab me. You put your hands on me and it's going to be you and me. Oh, Lord, she's going to have my mama. <laughs> she's going to have my mama. <laughs> Sorry. You put your hands on me, it's going to be you and me. You lay a hand on me and I'm going to splatter your brains all over these walls. That's a good thing. She didn't try me, though because she outweighed me by at least 50 pounds and I was still pretty much a one-armed bandit. But I would have given her a hell of a fight. I was mad and frustrated and I already stored about two or three months of anger. 
Anyway, I finally went back into the cell when I was ready. Her attitude made me defiant. Whenever she opened myself for anything, I would push past her and walk around for a minute. She was standing in the doorway like she was a door or something, and I would rear back and butt her out of the way. She was as big as a house, but she didn't have one bit of strength. Finally, she called the male guards. I was in one of the dorms talking to the women, wondering why she wasn't bothering me when about 10 male guards came into the room. Who is Joanne Chesimar? The guard, head guard asked. Nobody said anything. Which one of you is Joanne Chesimar? They looked like they were all ready to leap on somebody. Again, no one responded. All right, I'm going to ask you again. Which one of you is Joanne Chesimar? I'm Joanne Chesimar, Eva said. Well, when the guards took one look at Eva and saw how big she was, their tone changed immediately. Miss Chesimar, would you please return to your cell? One of the guards came from the back and tapped the sergeant on the shoulder. I know her, he said. She's not chair smart. I'm who you're looking for, I said. I didn't want Eva to get too involved in my madness. I'll see you sisters later. I've had enough excitement for the moment. I walked past and, and went into my cell and opened a book. The next day, the same guard managed to tick me off again. I don't want any more trouble out of you, she said. I don't want to have to call the men again. You can call the National Guard, the militia, the FBI, and anybody else for all I care. You can call your mother if you want to, I told her. As soon as she opened the door for lunch, I pushed right past her. I took my tray, sat down with the other women, and started eating my lunch. I didn't know what was going to happen, but I wanted to see what they were going to do. I had about three mouthfuls of food left on my plate when the goon squad came in. All right, get up and get in yourself. As soon as I finish what I have on my plate, now, they ordered. I only have two spoonfuls left. Now, they beckoned to the female guard. Remove the prisoner to her cell. She came near me with her hand stretched out. Don't you put your hands on me, I told her. I'll walk to my cell. Remove the prisoner to her cell, they ordered. She went to grab my arm and all at once the room was in motion. Chairs, tables, cups, trays were flying in the air. Everybody was either running to get out of the way or fighting. The female guard made a wild dash for the door. The male guards jumped on me. I was hitting, kicking, scratching, punching, biting. I didn't know what all else. They finally managed to get me into my cell and the other women locked into their dormitories. None of the other women was seriously injured. I had a few nicks and scratches, but otherwise I was fine. And I felt fine. Some of that anger pent up inside me had been released. One of the guards was wounded. Somehow his face got cut. He was the same little runt that had sat across from me in the hospital, pointing a shotgun at me and switching the safety on and off, talking about how he liked to kill animals. Nobody knows how or, I'm sorry, nobody knows how he was cut or who cut him. But everybody knows that Hunter got hunted. Later that day, they brought a photographer to photograph the evidence. The newspaper later reported a riot at the workhouse. Some police and the sheriff came around and, and searched the jail. They said they were looking for the weapon that had cut the guard. They didn't even find anything. That, that night, they came and got Eva. They took her to the room building in New Jersey Hospital for the criminally, crim criminally insane. She spent about three weeks there before she came back. The night she left, I felt sad and guilty. Here I got her caught up in my madness. I was sitting and thinking about her. So I sat down and wrote this poem. My nauseous woman, who nobody wants and everybody used. They say you're crazy because you're not crazy enough to kneel when told to kneel. Hey, big woman, with scars on the head and scars on the heart that never seemed to heal. I saw your light and it was shining. 
you gave them love. You gave they gave you shit. You gave them you. They gave you Hollywood. They purr at you because you know how to roar. Back it up with realness. Rhinoceros woman, big mama in a little world. You closed your eyes and neon spun inside your head because it was dark outside. You read your Bible, but God never came. Your daddy would have loved you, but that's what the neighbors say. They hate you, mama. Because you expose their madness and their cruelty. They can see in your eyes a thousand nightmares that they have made come true. Black woman, bad woman, clear your, so wear your bigness on your chest like a badge because you done earned it. Strong woman, Amazon, wear your scars like jewelry because they were bought with blood. They call you mad and almost had you believe in that shit. They called you ugly, and you hid yourself behind yourself and wallow in their shame. Rhinoceros woman, this world is blind and sight of mine. You cannot see how beautiful you are. I saw your light, and it was shining. Most of the women benefited from the riot, though. Over the next few days, almost everybody was released or sent to some kind of program. The jail was practically empty. It's strange how things work. When it suits the government's interest, they put people in jail for rioting. And when it suits their interest, they let them out for the same thing. Afterward, the outer door to my cage remained shut at all times. This was no great deprivation since I had remained, because it had remained closed most of the time before anyways. One day they bought me a big bushel of string beans. They grew a lot of their food at the workhouse. The men worked in the field. Here, I want you to snap these string beans. How much are you gonna pay me? I asked. You don't pay no inmate nothing. But if you snap these beans, we'll let your door stay open while you snap them. I don't work for nothing. I ain't gotta be no slave for nobody. Don't you know slavery is outlawed? <laughs> no, the guard said, you're wrong. Slavery was outlawed with the exception of prisons. Slavery is legal in prisons. I looked it up, and sure enough, she was right. The 13th Amendment to the Constitution says, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. <clears throat> Go on the Google machine and look up the 13th Amendment in the United States and it will read exactly as stated in this book. There is an exception for slavery within the Constitution of the United States, meaning that the prisons and jails within this country are literal plantations. Yes, slavery is legal in this country. It was never truly outlawed. It was never truly abolished. This is why prison abolitionists like myself exist because we're still abolitionists for slavery. Message! Well, that explained a lot of things. <laughs> oh, Asada. That explained why jails and prisons all over the country are filled to the brim with black and third world people. Why so many black people can't find a job on the streets and are forced to survive the best way they know how. Once you're in prison, there are plenty of jobs. If you don't want to work, they beat you up and throw you in the hole. If every state had to pay workers to do the jobs that prisoners 
are forced to do. The salaries would amount to billions. License plates alone would amount to millions. When Jimmy Carter, the governor of Georgia, he bought a black woman from prison to clean the state house and babysit for Amy. That humble peanut farmer that likes to build houses for humanity. That one. Prisons are a profitable business. They're a way of legally perpetuating slavery. In every state, more and more prisons are being built and even more on the drawing board. Who are they for? They certainly aren't planning to put white people in them. Prisoners are part of this government's genocidal war against black and third world people. There are a lot more white people in prison now because now it's not just race, but it's also class. However, even though black people are only about 14, 13, 14% of the prison of the black people are only 13 to 14% of the US population. We account for 40 plus percent of the prison population. I'm gonna say that again. Even though we're about 13 to 14% of the total population of the country, we are. 40 plus percent of the prison population in this country. We do not commit more crimes than white people any more than they do. We commit crimes at the same rate, which means that the majority of people in prison should be white people but nearly half the prison is black. Make that make sense. On July 19, 1973, I was taken to New York to be arraigned at a Queens Bank robbery indictment on a Queens Bank robbery indictment in Brooklyn Federal Court. The trip was like a surreal cartoon. Surre I'm sorry, a surrealistic cartoon. There must have been at least 12 cars in the procession, and a New Jersey State Trooper car was stationed at every exit on the turnpike. All the cars had lights on and sirens going. A helicopter trailed us, and the pigs in the car I was in were comical. At every point, they said something like, at least we got to the turnpike. At least we got to the bridge. At least we got to New York. At least we made it to court. Whenever they passed a police car, they waved and sometimes raised their fists. When the New Jersey, I'm sorry, when the Jersey police were replaced by New York police at the bridge to Staten Island, they shook hands and gave each other the power sign. They even called each other brother. This is my brother, officer, so and so. They acted like they were on some dangerous mission inside Russia. They were actually afraid. White people's fear of black people with guns will never cease to amaze me. Halt right there for a second. Unfortunately, what Asai said was true because the whole gun control debate, it started out of fear of black people. Why? Because in order to protect our neighborhoods, the Black Panthers, the Black Panther Party in California decided to roam their streets, protecting their neighborhoods with rifles. Because as we all know, the police don't do a damn thing to protect us. So black people took it upon themselves to protect themselves, to protect the, the, the women and children, to protect other people, the most disenfranchised among us, so that we would not be subject to 
the perils of what the police and the prison industrial complex do to us. That being said, Reagan, then Governor Reagan of California, decided to put gun control measures because he didn't want black people openly carrying guns or having concealed carry guns because he was afraid that black people would take up arms. So that's the whole reason for the gun control debate. This is why they're afraid of black people owning guns. This is why. Back to the paragraph. Probably it's because they think about what they would do were they in our place, especially the police who have done so much dirt to black people. Their guilty conscience tells them to be afraid. When black people seriously organize and take up arms to fight for our liberation, there will be a lot of white people who will drop dead from no other reason than their own guilt and fear. In September, I was moved from the workhouse and entombed in a basement of the Middlesex County Jail, allegedly because of the jail's proximity to Middlesex County Courthouse, where the New Jersey trial was scheduled to begin on October 1st. I was the first and last woman ever imprisoned there. It has always been a men's jail. When I arrived, I was given a dirty, scratchy horse blanket and one sheet. Thinking they had made a mistake, I asked for another sheet. That's all you get, they told me. I can't sleep with that filthy thing over me. I need a, another sheet. Sorry. Why am I allowed only one sheet? That's all the men get. We only get one because they might hang themselves. They can hang themselves easily with one sheet as they can with two, I reason. Sorry. For me to sleep on that filthy thing with one sheet was out of the question. I hooped, hollered, and demanded they call my lawyer and told the guards the next time she came into my cage, I was going to wrap the sheet around her neck. Finally, she gave me another sheet. <laughs> Don't mess with a soda boy. If I wrote a hundred pages describing the basement of the Middlesex County Jail, it would be impossible for you to visualize it. It was a big grayish perky greenish wall, pukey greenish wall. The ceiling was covered with all types of pipes, some small, some huge, some dry, some leaky. There was no natural light and the jailers refused to open the small windows located near the ceiling. The average temperature was 95 degrees. It was infested with ants and centipedes. I had never seen a centipede before and they scared me to death. There, they were huge albino monsters and they crawled all over me. Ugh. Footnote. On December 11th, 1978, Attorney General Lennox Hines, on behalf of the National Conference of Black Lawyers, the National Alliance Against Racism, and the Commission for Racial Justice at the United Church of Christ, sent a petition to the United Nations Commission on Human Rights alleging a, quote, consistent pattern of gross violations of human rights and fundamental freedoms of certain classes of prisoners in the United States because of their race, economic status, and political beliefs, end quote. In response to the petition, several international jurists visited the number of prisoners on August 30th, I'm sorry, August 3rd to 20th, 1979, and reported their findings. They listed four categories of prisoners, the first of which were political prisoners defined as, quote, a class of victims of FBI misconduct through the COINTELPRO strategy and other forms of illegal governmental conduct who was who as political activists have been selectively targeted for provocation, false arrests, entrapment, fabrication of evidence and spurious criminal prosecutions. 
This class is exemplified by at least the Wilmington 10, the Charlotte 3, Asada Shakur, Sandiata Akoli, Imari Obadil, and other Republic of New Africa descendant, descendants, David Rice, Ed Poindexter, Elmer Geronimo Pratt, Richard Marshall, Russell, Russell Means, Ted Means, and other American Indian Movement defendants. They considered my case in the section of their report dealing with solitary confinement, quote, one of the worst cases is that of Asada Shakur, who spent over 20 months in confinement in solitary confinement in two separate men's prisons, subject to con conditions totally unbefitting any prisoner. Many more months were spent in solitary confinement in mixed or all women's prisons. Presently, after protracted litigation, she is confined at Clinton Correctional Facility for Women in Maximum Security. She has never on any occasion been punished for any infraction of prison rules which might in any way justify such cruel or unusual treatment, end quote. Back to the paragraph. Female guards were stationed at the door of my cell 24 hours a day. Their job was to sit there and look in the cell at me. They could see every move I made. The first day I moved the bed against the wall away from the guard surveillance so that I could have a little privacy while I was sleeping. The guards ordered me to move the bed into the middle of the floor. I refused. The next day, workmen nailed the bed to the floor in the center of the cell. They even peeked through the window in the bathroom while I was in the toilet or taking a shower. When I covered the peephole with a towel or a uniform, they ordered me to remove it and threatened to take away all towels and uniforms if I continued covering the window. I didn't refuse. I simply ignored them. After a while, they gave up. A month later, one of the sergeants told me that I was permitted to cover the window when I used the bathroom, but only for three minutes. There were 12 four-foot-long fluorescent light bulbs in the cage that were blinding. When I got ready to go to sleep the first night, I asked the guard to turn off the lights. She refused. I can't see you if the light is <clears throat> I can't see you if the light is on. How in the world can you miss me? You can see everything in the cell. Sorry. They kept me under those blinding lights for days. I felt like I was going blind. I was seeing everything in doubles and triples. When Evelyn, my lawyer, came to see me, I complained. Finally, after Evelyn accused them of torture, they turned the lights off at 11. But every 10 or 15 minutes, they would shine a huge floodlight into the cell. Then the trial started. First, motions were argued. Practically all the motions were denied. All the prosecutions were granted. Then jury selection began before Judge John E. Bachman. Bachman. When they brought the first, I wonder if, he, if he's related to Michelle Bachman, the uh, former comic, congresswoman. When they brought in the first jury, jury panel, I thought I was going to have a heart attack. There were only a few blacks speckled here and there, and the panel looked more like a lynch mob than a jury. Most of the jurors openly glared at us as if they would kill us if they could. Half said they, they thought we were guilty. The other half, though, although they didn't say it right out, answered questions like they believed more or less they were probably that we were probably guilty. I was convinced some of them deliberately lied just to get on the jury and convict us. Most of the few black people excused themselves on the grounds of hardship. They had children, families, and jobs and simply could not afford to be on a lengthy jury trial. If ever there was a case of the blues, I had it. Do something, I kept telling the lawyers. Do something. What can we do, the lawyers would answer. We're doing the best we can. It was true, but I just could not accept it. This was my life they were talking about. I must have bugged the lawyers to death. Object to this. Object to that, I would tell them. Our objection is already on the record. Well, object again anyway. 
I was outraged, trapped, and helpless. Whenever a juror said something that revealed out and out prejudice, the judge would try to clean it up. Poor Ray Brown, one of the defense lawyers, caught most of my fire. I want you to object. On what basis, he would ask. Don't you see it? The judge is asking leading questions. But the judge is legally allowed to ask leading questions during jury selection. Well, object anyway. I knew nothing about law then. I had never even seen a trial. I just couldn't understand how the judge could be so blatantly prejudiced in favor of the prosecution. And there was nothing we could do about it. Pausing right there. This is why a lot when a lot of times people say the system works. No, it doesn't. Because the thing is that the system begins, hell, it begins in school. You ever heard of the school to prison pipeline? Guess what? It starts there. You have teachers that have prejudice against us, right? School administrators that have prejudice against us. They put school resource officers in the prisons. The prison, the I'm sorry, the schools, the school <laughs> 40 and slip. The schools are built a lot of times like prisons. And then, guess what? Then you're monitored closely by police in the streets. Then for even tiny infractions, then you're taken off the streets and put into jail. Then they put you in prison. And then when you're awaiting a trial or waiting to see a judge, hell, sometimes even the public defenders have a prejudice against you. The prosecution has the, the uh, a prejudice against you. The judge has a prejudice against you. If you go to trial, the jury has a prejudice against you. Hell, the media has a prejudice against you. And then the people who make the laws have a prejudice against you. And then a huge chunk of people who voted for the people who made the laws have a prejudice against you. And then the people who buy the politicians have a prejudice against you. So when people say the system works, they are bullshitting you. Because if the system works, then you would see a whole lot more justice. Speaking of justice, Justice T. Mm. All right, let's continue. Why can't y'all be like Perry Mason? I asked the lawyers jokingly. Did you ever see Perry Mason defend a black defendant? Ray Brown answered. That's a good question. Sundiata was a lifesaver. He could try to calm me down and would explain what to expect. Logically, I accepted what he said, but I was still frantic. We can't just def we just can't let ourselves be railroaded, I say, coming up with one idea after another. Sundiata would patiently explain why none of my fantastic ideas would work. After a while of participating in my own legal lynching, I became convinced that Sundiata and I should fire the lawyers and defend ourselves. And that way, we wouldn't be tied to those stupid rules and we could say anything we wanted to. That's not true, Sundiata told me. Even if you defend yourself, you're still bound by the rules. How am I supposed to know those rules? I'm not a lawyer and I still have a constitutional right to defend myself. True, but you still have to play according to their rules or they combine and gag you. Look at what they did to Bobby Seale. Every time I looked up at the jury box, I argued the point again, but I also knew that I didn't know one thing about the law and it was hard to picture myself actually defending myself. Evelyn was always repeating an old cliche that a person who defends himself has a fool for a lawyer. As we came closer and closer to contemplating the selection of the jury, 
I became more and more upset. Then one day, a kid who couldn't have been more than 20 was being examined as a potential juror. He spilled the beans. The judge asked him if he had an opinion of the case and he said, they say she's guilty. The judge questioned him further and he blurted it all out. The prosecutive judge, juror, I'm sorry, the prospective jurors in the jury room were talking about the case. Although they have been ordered not to discuss it, the judge asked what they were saying. They say she's guilty. Only Ms. Churismart, the judge asked. They were saying they're black, they're guilty. At the moment, the lawyers were all on their feet, talking a mile a minute. They demanded a complete investigation of what was going on in the jury room. They wanted the juror asked more questions. They wanted the jurors to whom he talked question. The judge immediately realized the boy had opened a can of worms. He did everything he could to avoid opening any sort op opening the can any further, but it had gotten out of his control. He finally agreed to conduct an impartial investigation. This time, when he questioned the jurors, he was very careful to downplay the gravity of what was going on in the jury room. But the other jurors subst substantiated what the boy had said. Our lawyers filed a motion asking that the jury be selected from another county because we couldn't get a fair trial in Middlesex. The assigned judge, I'm sorry, the assigned judge, not Judge Bachman, was to decide the motion. Meanwhile, the trial was stopped. Evelyn told me the decision. The assignment judge had determined that it was in fact true that we couldn't get a fair trial in Middlesex County. The jury was to be picked from Morris County. Where is that? I asked Evelyn. She said she hadn't the faintest idea. Then Rain Brown and Ray Brown came in. Where in the world is Morris County? I asked him. Well, he said, I'll tell you. Morris County was almost completely white with very few black people and even fewer Hispanics and Asians. What does that mean? Are there 10% black people? 5% or what? A whole lot fewer. A jury of your peers, Evelyn said bitterly. What can we do, I asked. We'll just have to wait and see. We can't get the trial moved somewhere else where there are Wait, sorry, can't we get the trial moved somewhere else where there are more black people? We can try, but don't get your hopes up too high. Pausing right there. Points where defendants are worried about having more people who are like them. That's sad. But that's the way it is. Because white supremacy and racism is so bad in this country that even seeing a group of white jurors we feel like we still can't get a fair trial. Even if it's a group of all of you who are watching, even though you all are, you know, maybe allies. Even still, just the, the, the fear that sits in the hearts of many of us black people, especially if we don't know you, it's just sad that we can't see you and feel, oh, well, these people will just objectively know what the truth is and they'll just judge based on the facts. It's just we feel that pressure so strongly from a lot of white people that we feel like we can't even be looked at or judge objectively in a fair way. So it's like if you don't see people who look like us, then we feel like we're doomed. That's what it feels like to be black in this country sometimes. 
all the time, really. Constantly being under the microscope and being judged harshly just because of the color of our skin. Back to the paragraph. I was coming back to earth and fast. The trial had been postponed for about a month until January because they needed time to secure the jail in Morristown in Morris County. I think I think I know where Morristown is. I'm originally from New Jersey. Um, I think I've been out there. But that that's like close to South Jersey, Morristown, Cherry Hill, uh, Clemington, Berlin, you know, all those. They're like small townships. And um, in a lot of those areas is very predominantly white. So I'm from South Jersey, but also Camden's in that area too, which Camden is mostly black, but that's Camden's like the hood. But then you go more towards central and south, central South Jersey, you start to get more white areas. So yeah. maybe I thought the lawyers would come up with something by then. I really didn't expect too much. But it seemed like such an obvious trick, such an obvious ploy to ensure that we didn't receive a fair trial by jury of our peers, that I thought maybe something could be done about it. I was naive in those days. I knew it in theory, but I had not seen enough to accept the fact there was absolutely no justice whatsoever for Black people in America. I still had some hopes left, but they had taken something that was supposed to help us and turn it against us. They had used the law to abuse the law. Now, all we have to do, I reason, is get the facts and figures and prove that they are trying to deny us a fair trial. How little did I know? Yep, that's it for chapter three and what she went through you know regarding being in solitary confinement which has been ruled as inhumane and cruel and unusual by international law and yet they still do it the united states still does it and so for people to say that the system works no Prison isn't for rehabilitation. I'm going to say it again. Prison is not for rehabilitation. It is punishment. And it, it does not serve us in any capacity to truly change ourselves. Do some people change? Yes. But it's not there for that. It is there to punish, enslave, and force us to work. That's it. There will be some programs, yes, but it depends on the security of the prison. If it's minimum security, then yeah, you know, maybe. But for the most part, no. So with that being said, that's the prison industrial complex. That's the way they operate. And it's sad that people have to go through that. But this is why we fight for change. So yeah, and a lot of people who are in prison are for there for small offenses, non-violent offenses, Victimless crimes, maybe for a drug possession that they were going to use themselves. That's how it uh, that's how it is. So yeah, a shot of Shakur, not a biography. Anywho, that was a deep reading.
Uh, we'll be starting on chapter four next time. What the hell? But yeah, we'll be starting on chapter four next time. And yeah, you know, I like doing these readings because it, it helps me grow. And I'm literally learning right before your eyes. And so I hope that you guys get a lot out of observing me grow in my understanding of how not only this world works, but getting historical analysis and even personal stories from like Asana Shakur, historical analysis by Michael Parenti, or getting, you know, firsthand accounts by George Jackson, you know? So that's one of the things I'm happy about. And this is one of the reasons why I do these readings. And so I just want to thank you guys. Have you liked the stream? Did you? Have you subscribed yet? Go ahead. Go ahead. Look, I don't bite. I don't. Unless you want me to. Let me stop. Let me stop. Stop it. I'm going to stop it. Anywho, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you so much to all the patrons on Patreon and Coffee, as well as my members as well, the JB members, and people who send me mutual aid. Um, and I hope to see you guys next time uh, when I do my live stream. My live stream, I'm going to be reacting to a video that was submitted by Neil's algorithm. Um, he's been in the chat asking for me to, uh, he's been asking for me to react to this video. So I will do a reaction to that live, as well as I will be speaking about a, uh, an article that talks about the empathy or the lack of compassion thereof of the wealthier you pe the wealthier you become so i'll be talking about that and there's also another story that i'll be talking about regarding junior rotc and so that's going to be a very interesting a very interesting subject because that story it's going to be wild. Uh, so if any of you guys remember being in high school, Junior ROTC or JROTC was very prominent in my school. Uh, it's still prominent in my school. My nieces and nephews go there now and in high schools. So that's going to be a very interesting concept. Not just a concept, but it, the, the facts that are coming out are ridiculous. So we're going to talk about that as well. The military industrial complex is really ramping shit up. And here's the thing. The military industrial complex is also connected to the prison industrial complex. As well as the police. So just letting you guys know. They're ramping things up. TLDR. I honestly think that they are really trying to bring back the draft. Because forcing people into military service would mean that the military industrial complex constantly has cannon fodder for them to constantly make more money. And that's honestly what I think is they're trying to do. So, but thank you so very much to everybody. I would love to bid you all a good day. Water your plants, water yourselves, lead the world better than you found it. Reading is fundamental. And um, continue to speak out for those who are political prisoners in this country. Because they are the ones that have been speaking the truth and are being punished for it. Mwah. Forehead kisses to every single one of you. Pick up a book, y'all. Reading is fundamental. 
butterfly in the sky. I can go twice as high. Take a look. It's in a book called Reading Rainbow.